Hi, this is Misha, and I have a new variation, I don't want to say a new rifle, but a new variation to show you today. At first, this probably looks a lot like your standard Colt LE 6920, and it is, but it also has a very unique barrel assembly. This is the 6920 HBPW. And what that stands for is, and what it really means, is Colt took an M4A1 SOCOM upper and dropped it on a semi-auto only M4 lower. This is pretty neat because this is the first time that I can recall that Colt has installed a 14 and a half inch barrel and they pinned and welded an extended flash hider. You can see the pin hold on the bottom to give an overall length of over 16 inches. We have the bayonet lug, we have the grenade step. And otherwise, we're pretty standard 6920 in the back. And to compare that with, the obvious answer is this gun here. This is the FN M4 Collector Series, or Military Collector Series. And this is FN's version of an M4A1. This is mine. It comes from the factories you see it here, except of course no optic on it. This is just a primary arms, nothing special of course. Everything else that you see on it came from the factory. So I thought we would compare these two and talk mostly about this relatively interesting, at least to me as a military collector, New version from Colt. Well, we have history videos on the evolution of the M16 and the carbine and all that, so I don't want to go into it now. I'll just kind of briefly recap where the M4 came from and where it's at today. In 1982, the U.S. military, spurred on by the Marines in the Army for the most part, adopted the M16A2. Now the A2 was an upgrade of the original M16A1, which dated back to 1967 when it was officially adopted. The main differences with the A2 were that it had the faster 1 in 7 twist rate for the 62 grain projectile that had been recently adopted by NATO. Also, whereas the M16A1 was safe, semi-auto, single shot, and fully automatic, the A2 was adopted as a safe semi-auto three-round burst option. Now there was a version that was safe semi-auto full auto known as the M16A3. However, many more A2s were used compared to A3s and many of the A3s were used by the Navy. The A2 still had a fixed carry handle, but it had a more finely adjustable rear sight. It had a longer fixed buttstock. It still had the 20 inch barrel, although they did make it a heavier profile at the gas block in front, although it was still thinner under the handguard. We had the longer A2 style handguards and many other small changes, such as adding the brass deflector, going to the more modern style forward assist, and the A2 pistol grip, and the A2 flash hider, amongst many others. If you're interested in that, check out our other videos. They'll be in the, um, in the playlists. After adopting the rifle, as early as 1984, the military expressed interest in having an updated version of the carbine. They had used the XM-177 series during Vietnam, and so Colt was working with the new A2 pattern for carbines starting in the mid-80s, Updating them slowly over time, adding things like the A2 sights, the 1 in 7 twist rate, so on and so forth. The military started to prototype and test out 
these guns in 86. And really by 91, Colt had more or less finalized on their Model 920, which was soon designated as the XM4. And it would have essentially all the features of the A2 but scaled down, a 14 and a half inch barrel. It would be thin under the hand guards. It would have larger hand guards, so that would double heat shield. It would be three round burst, like the A2. It would have a fixed carry handle with A2 sights. Originally, it would have a four position stock, but it would be the so-called fiber light or late car 15 style. It would have a step down in the barrel, such as this one has here, to accommodate the M203 grenade launcher, under barrel grenade launcher. And it would mount the standard M7 and later M9 bayonets. Officially, the military would adopt this as the M4 in 1994, and Colt would deliver the first batches by 1995 with the fixed carry handle. However, this was quickly changed to a removable carry handle with a Picatinny rail compatible. Picatinny standards were actually very new in the 90s with a removable carry handle, and this would be the standard M4. And it would start to see widespread issuance by the late 90s, seeing its first really extensive combat in 1999. Of course, it was used in Afghanistan and the Second Iraq War to great effect, and it eventually replaced all the M16s in the Army, Navy, and eventually in the Marines. The Marines hung on to the M16 longer than anyone else using the M16A4 variant, which we also have a separate video on. But by 2013, they started to get more and more M4s, and by 2015, even the Marines said the M4 was essentially front line, and they retired all their M16s to second line. So that's kind of where the M4 ended up. But in the 21st century, some um, shortcomings were discovered. And this led to the M4A1, which started to appear. Now, Colt had been offering what they called the 921 for forever. I mean, it was basically the same as the 920, but it had safe, semi, full auto. So it was analogous to a carbine version of the M16A3. Well, the military became more interested in this after experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan and really began to buy the full auto version instead of the three round burst version in limited numbers and then by 2009 2010 in larger and larger numbers they would designate this as the m4a1 technically the only difference between an m4 and an m4a1 is this full auto instead of three round burst in addition to buying factory built m4a1s from colt they would also buy tens of thousands of conversion kits for the M4, so it was quite easy to convert them. Now, since the M4A1 was capable of full auto sustained fire, they quickly found that the barrel, which was thin on the M4 under the hand guards to accommodate the grenade launcher, could overheat. So Colt would do the 921 HB heavy barrel with the thicker profile all the way back. Now we would know this as a SOCOM barrel and it was actually quite effective. Over time other changes would creep into the design such as an ambidextrous safety, various rail hand guards in the block 1 and block 2 series, so on and so forth. And these are all very easily identifiable with the M4A1 but it's really the full auto, and then more recently, the heavier barrel. Then all the newer guns have had the, the heavier SOCOM profile barrel so they can work better. So that gets us to where we're at now. The military has been buying these in quite large numbers. Up until about 2012, they were all coming from Colt, but after some legal wrangling, the military first contracted with Remington to build M4A1s. However, this more or less fell through, and FN took over in 2013, along with Colts, to, de to deliver quite a large contract. In fact, the military has been ordering M4A1s 
in the hundreds of thousands for the last several years and converting other M4s over. So people who think the, the AR-15 series is on the way out in our military, they need to look at the procurement numbers. They, they, they wouldn't keep buying them in large numbers and converting older guns if they weren't still interested in keeping it. So Colt and FN both have made the M4A1 for the military. Now what Colt started doing around 2012, maybe 2011, I don't quite remember, a few years back, they offered the SOCOM series. This would be the LE6920 SOCOM, the original SOCOM 1, as some might call it. And it was extremely similar to this gun from Colt, though. It would come from Colt with the Knight's Armament quad rail system, vertical foregrip included, rail panels. It would also have the Maytac rear sight. Come on. There we go. Flat top upper from the factory, standard stock. It would have the ambidextrous double-sided safety. And the H2 buffer would be in the SOCOM, the Colt SOCOM. However, while the SOCOM would have the step here in the barrel, it would not have a step back here, although it would have the heavy profile. And it would have a 16 inch barrel, 16.1 give or take, with removable A2 flash hider. So it would still have the longer barrel. They would also do the LE6920 SOCOM 2, which would have the Block 2 style rail system made by Daniel Defense. This was more of a full length rail, although it still had a fixed front sight, which I always found was kind of unusual. Now these guns sold in the mid thousands, anywhere from um, 13 to 16,000 when they were new. But after they went out of production, especially the SOCOM 1, became quite collectible, selling for 18 to 2,000 and up on Gunbroker. This was the closest to an M4A1 that Colt would do, even marking them on the Magwell M4A1, which became desirable in and of itself just for the receiver. In response, three years ago, FN would do their military collector series offering the M4, as they would call it, although it's just marked FN15, and the M16, marked again FN15, and we have a video on both of those. This is the M4 version. The M16 version is analogous to the M16A4. It's the same as this, it just has the longer barrel and, of course, the fixed stock and the longer Knight's rail system. So that was FN's response. The problem was FN, while they could sell AR-15s commercially and they could manufacture military AR-15s using the TDP, could not legally use the TDP to manufacture their military collector series. So technically, while they were great guns, they weren't manufactured with the literal mil spec. However, Colt, since they own the rights to the M4, although they're no longer exclusive, can manufacture guns to as close to TDP as they wish. This is why people wanted a Colt to do a gun like this for a very long time. And I guess they became hungry enough and they finally have done a 14 and a half pin and welded gun and it has the heavy profile barrel which we're about to look at. However, like most things Colt, it's kind of one of those so close yet so far away. But what they didn't quite get right on this is still quite correctable. So we're going to compare these two and give final thoughts at the end. So let's start off with the barrel, which is really the key point on both of these. And I'm not going to keep you waiting. This is a true 14 and a half inch SOCOM profile type barrel. It has the step down for the 203 or now the 320 grenade launcher here. It also has the flats cut into the thick barrel. You can see this is much heavier than on your standard M4, but they had to put a little flat there for your grenade launcher. The FN looks the same, except it does not have these flats here. It has the one out front. What did I lay my... There we go. 
it doesn't have the flats under the handguard, which really isn't a big deal, but one tells you it's a true military barrel and the other one is not. Another easy tell, this is an honest to God 14 and a half inch barrel. Whereas this is actually about a 14.7, maybe 7.5. The reason is this uses a pinned and welded on standard A2 flash hider. The pin is actually, let's see, you can feel it on one of these sides here. Flip it over. This one's actually on the side here. Just a cross pin to keep it from unscrewing. It's like I said, just a slightly longer barrel. Whereas the Colt uses an extended, quite an interesting style of extended A2 flash shatter as well. As you see the flats, this rear section is actually what's extended out just a bit on this, this back area. The fronts, the slots are the same. The back's just stretched out about a third of an inch. And it's pinned on the bottom. You can see a hole there. Now these both have bayonet lugs, which means they will mount a bayonet much better than a 6920 or other 16 inch carbine. On the FN, it has a little play because it's mounting really right behind the flash hider more on the lock washer ring there but still much better than on a standard 16 inch where it'd be way back here on the barrel so a little play but not too bad this also came with the military style reversible side sling mount nothing on the bottom except the bracket fixed front a2 style sight, F marked. The Colt, let's see here. We've got our bayonet lock. Now since this is the correct barrel length, we're gonna be, get my slings so far the way there, guys. There we go. We're actually gonna be on the back, on the rear, right over the flats where it should be, so it's gonna fit a little tighter. And here you can see how the flash cutter sticks out a little further. So actually, the FN has ever so slightly a shorter overall length. This thing is like a 16.1, right at the limit. This thing's more at about 16.2 to 16.3 because of the longer flash cutter. But the flip side is, if you remove this flash cutter, you have a 14.7 barrel, so close you were to remove this one say for an SBR or to replace it with say a surefire you would have the authentic 14.5 it also came with this side sling mount reversible and the A2 F marked style front sight base now moving on this is a pretty standard 6920 we have the standard M4 double heat shield handguards flat top upper. It comes with a Magpul Embus polymer rear sight, which Colt's been using for several years now. We have a standard lower marked M4 carbine. We have standard dust cover, brass deflector, forward assist, A2 grip. We have a standard single-sided safety, and it is the semi-auto safety. I say that because it doesn't have the hash mark, the tick mark, although it does have safe and fire on this side. You can see it's just this taller semi-auto only safety. Standard charging handle. We have a standard four position mil spec stock with staked castle nut. 
The FN, on the other hand, comes more decked out. As I showed in the beginning, we have the Knight's quad rail system. This is the earlier style. It does come with the broom handle grip and the rail covers. Flat top upper, Maytech rear sight, fully adjustable, no spec. We're marked FN15 down here. We have the barcode. I guess I'll go ahead and flip it now, I'll show you. On this side, a little sticker. The Colt has the engraved barcode. This has the ambidextrous safety, which isn't necessarily standard on M4A1, but it's getting more and more common. And these can be dropped into any gun. A2 grip, standard trigger. This has a six position tube, but it is still staked in place. It comes with this FN marked stock on the side and even on the back. So let's look at the insides a wee bit. The Colt comes with a metal 30 round alloy mag. And to be fair, so does the FN. And that's really about it. They both come with manuals, of course, and they both come with cardboard boxes. The Colt comes in a standard 6920 box. The FN comes in a heavier, dutier box marked with collector series and all that jazz and some graphics on it. It's still a cardboard box. Looking inside, we have a marked hammer for mill spec, but it is notched. We also have the web and the lower receiver. We have a simple H marked buffer, not H2. And we have an M16 style bolt carrier group. And the bolt carrier is marked C and the bolt MP. And the gas key is properly staked. And we have M4 feed ramps, which is pretty well standard with Colt. Let's put my mag back in so I don't mix them up, folks. And the FN is very similar inside. We have a military spec bolt group again, M16. Of course, it's not marked with C. M4 feed ramps. We have an actual full auto style hammer. Neat. We do not have the web. Now I have put an H2 buffer in this one. That's something I did. Originally, it came with this guy over here. Pull it out. Typical H buffer as well. The reason I took this one out. It's a little rattly, and it actually kind of led to that spoing that some ARs have. But when I put an actual Colt buffer in, that spoing went away on this FN, so did that. The only other difference I can think of, this has the standard selector stops. It also has safe fire in auto, with the auto being completely inert just there for the look of it some have complained that it should say safe semi auto the Colt on the other hand has their trademark selector stops where they're milled off this is standard they've done it since the earliest SP1s and it has just standard markings without a fake auto marking which doesn't surprise me at all Colt being Colt. So that's a pretty detailed run through I would say. How do they feel? And then we'll end up here. Well the Colt much like a 6920 
relatively tight, but a little play, which you'd expect. Stock is the same, a little bit of play, but actually feels quite solid. Bolt is relatively smooth. Trigger is military, but actually pretty light. It's got a little some take up, but you know, military trigger. It feels like a Colt. Not much play in the handguards, in fact, next to none. Not a lot of play in the receivers. There's a little bit of, well, the front is basically solid. No play up here. It's a little bit in the back, side to side. But the front is solid, which I like. The pins are tight without being crazy tight. And the fit and finish is typical Colt. Not, it's, it's mil spec. The FN, now this one's used, of course, so it's not a, a real fair comparison. Got a little more play in the stock. A little smoother, though. The bolt is smooth on this, but again, it's been shot, but even when new, it was still very smooth. Trigger has very little take up and is a little smoother, but also a little bit heavier. The finish is much more commercial grade. It's a glossier anodizing and parkerizing. Still military style, but a little bit glossier, a little bit prettier. There is only a tiny bit of play in the lower part of this handguard, which is a two-piece. That's Knight's Armament for you. The upper is solid, of course. The receivers have the same tiny amount of play. The front has just a tiny amount of side to side, and the bottom has about the same, maybe a little bit more than the Colt. But again, military guns. So, I have to say the FN still feels a little nicer. But it's still a commercial gun built to be as close to military as they can get away with. Using a lot of military contract NSN numbered parts like the handguard, the sight, and all that. Whereas the Colt is made, presumably, just like their military guns, but dropped on a semi-lower. I think that's why all the upper components have the proper markings, the barrel, the bolt group. The only thing that's really not military on this upper is the rear sight, although Magpul sights, of course, do appear on some standard M4s. And the same with the handguards. Technically, some M4A1s would have M4 handguards as well, although these days, the rail. Now one thing I do like is this side sling swivel. Most all of your newer 6920s will have the bottom one. They used to do the side all the time, but they've kind of stopped in recent years. And of course the flash shotter is not mil spec just because it's longer because it has to be. So it seems to me that Colt took M4A1 SOCOM style uppers that they had left over and they dropped them onto their standard 6920 lower, which is A-OK -okay with me. I've been told, anecdotally, that they did about 300 of the 6920 HB PW. So, not a large number, and they seem to be more or less sold out most places now. I do also like that they ship these with a metal mag, and not the typical mag pull. It's a small thing, but at least shows a little care. That's all they come with, no sling or anything. The old SOCOMs did come with some other gear. Then again, the FN doesn't come with anything but a mag either. And the SOCOMs were quite a bit more expensive. These are not priced a lot more than your typical 6920, $100 or less. So you're looking at, roughly speaking, $1,000 to $1,200 now. However, as these dry up, I don't know. I've seen just Colt SOCOM profile barrels in years past on Gunburker go for several hundred dollars, four, five, six hundred dollars just for the barrel. This is a complete factory built gun that comes in a serial matched box, which is pretty neat if you ask me, personally. So, which one am I keeping? I don't know yet. This FN has been a really good shooter. It's really smooth, really nice. But the Colt, if I put on a Knight's handguard, ambidextrous safety, 
Maytac rear sight. I would have the same gun. Also, I'd probably put in the H2 buffer out of that one into this one. So a few small changes, none of which would require any gunsmithing and wouldn't require more than $200 to do it completely. I can make this into what the 6920 SOCOM should have been all along. So I'm going to have to think about it. But I think it's really neat. I don't think Colt probably set out to do this. I think it was a typical Colt situation where they had the uppers, they needed some money, they put them on the lowers, but, and I don't care, some of the coolest guns from Colt have kind of come from that. The uh, 6320 comes to mind, which we have a video on as well. I'm just going to make that a tagline. Well, this is the initial review. As we do more with this gun, we'll let you know. If you haven't heard of the 6920 HB PW, we're happy to bring it to you. If you have and have one, please share with us what you think about it and what you've done with it. Interested to see how people are reacting to these because they kind of came in under the radar. And I'm sure it'll have typical 6920 reliability. Say what you will about Colt's fit and finish over the years. The reliability has always been very good, as is accuracy. We appreciate you turning in, of course. Every view is really appreciated. If you like the video, we'd appreciate it too if you click like, and also we'd love for you to comment below. And if you'd like to help support us even more than just watching our videos, which is already great support, please click on the link and check out our Patreon page. This is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.